Hey folks, Bill Hinckley coming to you from Cincinnati, Ohio, USA. So Min asked me uh, to send him some comments about a metric that I'm using here in Cincinnati for emergency airway management success that I call DASH 1A, which stands for Definitive Airway Sans Hypoxia on the First Attempt. Uh, Min had a recent podcast, I believe it was number four, on his pre-hospital and retrieval medicine site, uh, where he had a discussion with Toby Fogg regarding uh, airway registries and metrics for emergency airway success. And I had written some comments about uh, my concept of Dash 1A that we're using here in Cincinnati. And I guess Min was interested and asked me to send him uh, some further discussion of, of that topic. So here it is. If you think about uh, in your program, uh, in your emergency department or your HEMS program, your transport medicine program, uh, the metric of success that you use, it's probably going to be first pass success. This is what most people are looking at. And this is Glidescope's tagline, after all, designed for first pass success. Uh, and most people in emergency airway management QA are looking at first pass success as their metric of success. Uh, some people just report overall success rates. Uh, most people look at first pass success. And not just in QA in individual programs or emergency departments, but also in the emergency airway management literature, uh, that's pretty abundant at this point that's been published. Usually, what's reported is overall success or first pass success. Uh, there's typically some discussion of physiology and how many patients had hypoxia and so forth, but it, it typically is not uh, one of the definitive outcomes that are looked at in the literature that's published. So what, what's the problem with first pass success? In my nomenclature, uh, first pass success is DA1A, definitive airway on the first attempt. So I'm not an economist. I've got a degree in medicine, I've got a degree in kinesiology, and I certainly do not have a degree in economics. But I have read Freakonomics. This is a pretty awesome book that I would recommend. Um, and in it, uh, the authors discuss the incredible importance of incentives to governing human behavior. This is a concept that I buy. And uh, think about the last time you had a performance review with your boss. I don't care if you're a doc, a nurse, a paramedic. Uh, at some point, you have performance reviews with uh, whoever you report to. And in those performance reviews, I bet you your boss reviews with you your performance on various metrics that are important to your boss. And you have thought to yourself, this metric is important to my boss, so it should be important to me as well. You know, for me, uh, these are things like, how am I doing on the press gainies? Um, how am I doing on my door-to-dock time in the emergency department? Uh, what are my uh, door-to-balloon times for STEMI patients that I see? Stuff like that. And since they're important to my boss, they're important to me to doing well on these metrics. Well, there's the problem in my book with first pass success. If you are performing epiglottoscopy or laryngoscopy on a patient and you're having a tough time and the patient's pulse ox starts to dwindle and it gets down to the low 90s and you're getting to the steep part of that oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, what you should do is pull out and bag the patient back up. First pass success, however, incentivizes you to keep going, to try to get that airway on the first attempt, because there's no disincentive to continuing on, and maybe you finally get the patient intubated, but they critically desat down to 50%. Well, if the metric is first pass success, you were still successful. But in, the, in terms of the patient's actual physiology and outcome, I don't think you were successful. So that's my problem with first pass success as an airway management metric. So some people have said to me, well, shouldn't our metric then just be success sans hypoxia or DASH, definitive airway sans hypoxia, in any number of attempts? Because if you avoid hypoxia, 
Does it really matter whether it took you one attempt or three to get there? And frankly, that's a pretty good argument. Uh, but I do have one problem with it that I'll get to in a little bit. Now, other people have said to me, all right, Hinckley, how critical is the D, the definitive? First of all, what do I mean by definitive? Uh, in, in my book, a definitive airway is one in which I've got a cuff blown up below the cords. And, uh, you know, people like Darren Brody in New Mexico have advocated uh, that the D is not that important. Uh, Darren has published a concept known as RSA, Rapid Sequence Airway, in which he advocates for patients with uh, significant predictors of difficult laryngoscopy that you don't even try. Uh, so the concept of RSA is you give an induction agent followed by a paralytic agent, and then you go straight to placement of a rescue airway. So maybe it's automate sucks LMA, Maybe it's uh, ketamine, rock, king. Uh, but basically, there's no uh, attempt at laryngoscopy in the meantime. And I think this is a, a, a really a innovative concept that likely does have a role in some settings. But at least for, for me and my own team, Darren, you're going to have to forgive. I'm old-fashioned enough that I still prefer... A balloon blown up below the cords. So do we want just first pass success? No. I don't think we do because that uh, basically incentivizes us to continue laryngoscopy attempts once the patient is critically desatting. Do we want just success sans hypoxia no matter how many attempts? And I think the answer is no there as well, because then there's no incentive to, to maximize that first attempt. So, in my book, we want both. And that's what the concept of Dash 1A is. Definitive airway sans hypoxia on the first attempt. So what are the keys to achieving Dash 1A? All right, everybody knows Moses brought the Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai. And the first commandment was, thou shalt maximize thy first attempt. This is a concept that has been pounded into me from uh, day one of residency uh, by many people. Ron Walls at Harvard, the author of Emergency Airway Management, which is basically my Bible. Carry it with me everywhere like a complete dork. Uh, concept pounded into me by Steve Carlton, the gentleman on the upper right there, who is my mentor here in Cincinnati and taught me most of what I know about airway management, we must maximize our first attempt. But how? There's been an awesome guide to help us in that regard published recently by uh, Scott Weingart and Rich Levitan, Pre-Oxygenation and Prevention of Desaturation During Emergency Airway Management, Annals of Emergency Medicine 2012. If you haven't read this article, you need to crawl out of the hole that you've been in for the past couple of months and you need to read this. And then the next thing that you should do is you need to read it again. This is one of the most important papers that's been published in the emergency literature in the past 10 years in my book. And it's got all kinds of pearls that help us maximize our first attempt and basically will help us achieve Dash 1A. Uh, things like proper positioning of patients, um, things like proper pre-oxygenation, you don't want to be satisfied if you can avoid it with just starting at a pulse ox of 96. Uh, certainly don't want to be satisfied with 92. You want to do everything you can to be starting uh, from as close to 100% as, as you can uh, to avoid desaturation. Now, some other things we can do to maximize that first attempt. If we're doing direct laryngoscopy, we need to be using a straight-to-cuff shape for the ET tube. Dr. Levitan's research has shown us unequivocally that this maximizes your chance of being successful. And the more curved you've got that hockey stick, the worse your chances are. 25 degrees is probably best. Uh, I realize that if you're using a video laryngoscope, then you may need a specific different tube shape. But if you're doing direct straight to cuff, 25 degrees is the way to go. Uh, bimanual laryngoscopy is another thing that can help us maximize that first attempt. 
And this is a tough one. I manage a lot of airways. And I'll tell you that even in the heat of, heat of the moment, even I sometimes forget about bimanual laryngoscopy. That right hand is just kind of sitting there flapping in the breeze while you're doing laryngoscopy. And you might as well use it. Position that airway where you need it to be to see it and place a tube through it. So we need to train ourselves not to forget about this option. And then our friend, the bougie, $6 of pure blue plastic awesomeness. In my book, the bougie needs to be out and ready beside the right hand of the innovator on every emergency airway attempt that's done, wherever, in any setting. Uh, the bougie can bail you out from an epiglottis-only view and can still allow you to achieve Dash 1A success. So I'm not going to go into all the, the tips and tricks of uh, proper utilization of the bougie. That's been covered recently on the MCRIT site. And if you haven't seen that post uh, that Scott put up from John McGill at Hennepin County, you need to check it out. But the bougie is absolutely key to maximizing your chance of being successful on Dash 1A. Um, also, when we're doing rapid sequence intubation, we need to make sure that we're using proper dosage of the paralytic. Uh, go big or go home. There's no such thing as overdosing a paralytic in the setting of RSI. So uh, when in doubt, err on the side of a higher dose, I would say. And uh, another point is we need to not be doing airways as crash airways if they're not crash. And to me, basically, that means if they got a pulse I'm doing RSI. I'm not uh, going in without drugs because the last neuron to die in the brain of a dying man is the one that makes his jaw clench when you put a sword in his mouth. Crash airways in patients with a pulse are rarely successful. So don't do it crash unless it's truly crash. All right, you can't manage what you can't measure. Churchill said, no matter how beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally look at the results. I think you should look at the results more than occasionally. So what is achievable in terms of Dash 1A success? Well, I can't speak to the emergency department because our ED is not yet using this metric. I can speak to the HEMS setting uh, where I've been measuring Dash 1A success for the past four years. And in those four years, uh, we've achieved 65% success thus far, as far as uh, definitive airway sans hypoxia on the first attempt. Is that good? I, I don't really know. I got nothing to compare it to because uh, other people aren't measuring this metric yet. Um, one comparison is near the National Emergency Airway Registry, published uh, several years ago. And these were emergency department innovations performed by emergency physicians, mostly emergency residents. Uh, and the success rate in that was 83%. So obviously 65 is 18 less than 83. That being said, it's a more rigorous metric. Uh, being performed in more challenging situations because most of our airways are uh, in seeing trauma patients. And uh, so they're almost all immobilized. Uh, many of them have significant facial trauma, a lot of blood in the airway. And uh, these airways are being performed on roadsides and cornfields and in ambulances. So I'm relatively satisfied at 65%. I do think we can do better. There have been some quarters where we've been able to push that up to 75%, and I think that long-term, we can stay at 75%. That's what I'm pushing for now. Uh, and in the future, I think with improved techniques, improved equipment, and continuing to practice all the tenants that I've just talked about, I think we can probably get in the realm of 85%. I don't think we'll ever get to 100%. Uh, at least in the transport medicine setting. I think our environment is too challenging. Our patients have uh, have too many challenges to uh, allow us to get to 100% success. But I'd love to see us get to 85%, which would actually be a higher uh, success rate with a more stringent criteria and a more challenging environment than the 83% achieved by NEAR. Now, a couple of 
uh, questions that I still have in my mind about this concept. What do you do about the patients who, despite your best efforts at pre-oxygenation, uh, the best pulse ox you can get prior to your laryngoscopy attempt is less than 90%. So let's say you do DSI and uh, you give the patient ketamine and then you put them on non-invasive ventilation and even with maximizing your non-invasive settings, the best pulse ox you can get the patient up to because of whatever shunt they have uh, is 88%. And then you do your laryngoscopy and the lowest they go uh, during your attempt is 82%. And then you get them tubed and uh, you bag them back up, you put them on the vent, and they're back at 88% again. Is that a dash 1A success? Well, technically no, because there was hypoxia involved, uh, but it was unavoidable. So realistically, I think that should probably be credited as a success. Uh, but it, it gets a little hairy if you give that success because then you have to ask the question, did you really do everything you could have done to pre-oxygenate the patient? So that's a tough one. I'm still trying to get my mind around how to handle that situation. Um, another issue is right now, at least for the past four years, uh, when I tell you our success rate has been 65%, that's me uh, relying on the, the recall and the honesty of my crew. Um, and, uh, you know, if a, if a patient uh, briefly desatted down to 88%, but the crew tells me that the lowest sat was uh, 91 because that's their recollection, then I've got to go with that and give them credit for the success. Now, in the future, more and more monitors are actually uh, giving a continuous recording uh, that uh, a medical director later on can access to see whether or not there truly was any hypoxia. Uh, and it takes recall and honesty out of the equation completely and is more objective. So I think that's the way we need to go. And then the third question I have in my mind is, what about the importance of maintaining eucapnia as well? Um, because uh, again, uh, as we move into uh, more modern, modern monitoring equipment, um, we've got devices that are putting out by companies like Iridian, which can tell us uh, what was the patient's entitled CO2 throughout the whole process and how important is it to uh, maintaining eucapnia or at least avoiding severely deranged um, hypercapnia or hypocapnia. We know it's pretty important in TBI patients. How important is it for everybody else as well? Um, so that may be a future amendment to uh, Dash 1A and what is the ultimate airway success metric. But for now, Dash 1A is working well for us in Cincinnati, and I'd love to talk to any of you about it, get your thoughts, and I'd like to thank Min for asking me to uh, discuss the topic. Thank you.